Thank you for joining us this morning. This morning we'll be singing, It Is Well With My Soul, 214. Shall we stand as we sing? Junior Church to be dismissed as we sing the fourth verse.
And then it moved on to what, as I've been doing with each of those churches, moved on into look at the history of the church during those time periods. That first time period was 30 AD to about 100 AD. We looked at the church of Ephesus as, as sort of the example church during that time period. And, and so we looked at the history involved with that. Then Smyrna went from about 100 to 300. It was the example church if you will, during that time period. And, and so we went through that history. Pergamos, again, another 200-year history uh, from about 300 to 500, uh, as it was the example church. And now, last couple of weeks, we've been in Thyatira, and it is the example church. But the thing about that and why we've been spending so much time here, and, and I hope to end that today, is there's a thousand years. You know, we had, what, 70 years and then two of a couple of hundred years, we move into this area where Thyatira is sort of the example church during this time period. It's a thousand years of history. And so trying to just bounce off, okay, what's the scripture saying? And what is the history of that time period it has been taking uh, more time than I would have liked. But again, we're going to pick up, we're going to look at the, we're going to read the scriptures here, begin in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. If you stand for the reading of God's word, those who can. Be in verse 18. Under the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, thy patience, and thy works, and the last be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he, which searcheth the reins and the hearts. I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira. Now all those who have been following Jezebel is what he's been talking about. We get to verse 24. But unto you I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. They have not gone off and followed false doctrine. And which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the time that we have had to just spend walking through these churches and, and also the history behind these churches. And so now this morning, as we come back to Thyatira, God, may we finish this up today. May you be honored and glorified. May we see what bloomed out of this sin, what bloomed again out of these, looking towards them who worship idols. It was Jezebel who brought idols into Israel in the Old Testament. It was she that had them, again, committing fornication, worshiping and praying to idols. He is using her name simply to bring attention as to what this model church did during this thousand-year time period. As our Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the truth. Thank you for all you've done. Open our hearts and minds. And God, may we leave better prepared to be witnesses for Jesus Christ this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Again, as we began by walking through the scripture I just read, and just walking through that pretty much verse by verse, and then we shifted over and started looking at this matter of the history and a, and a couple of things came up. I know in the beginning, and I was using the Mormon church as an example a couple of weeks or three weeks ago. And, and I said, I believe that, they, that the Mormons actually watch the same thing every week uh, that they have, like the president or one of their, their, their bishops. 
and, and they, they all watch the same thing every week. I've been told that. Uh, a little further research, that's not what they do. Uh, they have ministers that, that work throughout the week, and I'm just correcting a mistake I made. Uh, what they do is twice a year, multiple days a year, uh, they do two different times, multiple days, um, they're, they have this around the world. I mean, whether, whether they, you know, it's on television, it's on their computers, uh, it goes around the world. And so they all hear the same thing by the same people through interpreters. And so I was, you know, I was wrong in thinking it was every week. It's not. And I just wanted to correct that mistake. Uh, but again, as we were looking here in Thyatira, it was the Middle Ages, also known as the what? Dark Ages. Uh, it was because man stopped progressing in their knowledge, in their education, and even their abilities. Uh, suddenly, and again, with the church taking over, and in this, this church ultimately becomes the Roman Catholic Church. And I said last week, I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying this is history. This is how they came together. And so that's continuing this week is what we're looking at. We're simply looking at the history, and this history surrounds the Roman Catholic Church. The only ones that it doesn't, again, affect is those ones who he said, but those who have not accepted this doctrine. And so there was always those, again, we talked about this last year, there's always a what? Remnant. Always a remnant. And so there was this remnant that was literally referred to in that point in time as the free church. And so there was this church free from the rest, again, of what was going on within so-called Christendom at the time. But again, the church established itself, and it established itself in Rome, uh, and it become, began to be as the Catholic church, which means the universal church. And the idea there with Catholic uh, means it's, it's the only church, okay? It's the universal church. It's the church everywhere. And, and that's what they teach. They're the only true church. And, and so as we walk through, this is all being put together. It's all being built during the Dark Ages. They came to a point, and we will see this a little bit later, where they actually discouraged people, number one, from, from learning to read. From reading, they were told they couldn't read the Bible. And the only ones who could read and interpret the Word of God were the priests. And so the only way to know the word of God was to be in church and listen to the priests. And so, you know, that they began to take away from them uh, the, the ability, if you will, uh, to read the word of God. And they separated them from God's word. Uh, the Latin services, we just touched on this a little bit last week, they switched over the services to Latin. And again, at first, again, we're talking about that thousand-year period of time, about 500 B.C. to 1500, I'm sorry, A.D., well, B.C., A.D. to about 1500 A.D., the thousand-year period of, of church age. What's going on? Well, this is what was going on, the, what became the Roman Catholic Church. And they begin to separate the people from the Word of God, Latin services. Uh, they switched it over. All the services are in Latin. The communion services remained being preached in Latin up until the 1960s. And so if you were going to be there you know, for the main service, it was, again, the priests went through it and all the congregants uh, repeated back certain things in Latin. I was in two services like that uh, over the years. And, uh, and again, it's very, very odd. I didn't have a clue. What, what's going on? What's he saying? You know, and, and you're reading, what do they call it? A missalette? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're reading back the missalette. Okay, great. Um, but they took away God's word. You can't read it. You can't understand it. The only people who understand it is the priest. And if they understand it, then they're going to communicate with you, but you need to know Latin because that's all we're going to talk in, which wasn't the language of the people in, in so many areas. The priest, the term priest began to be used uh, during this time period. Matter of fact, it first started to be used in Pergamos just, just prior uh, to this time period, but it became prevalent. And so they began to call them priests. And, and the idea there was that they were in a, the Bible calls us what? Pastors, bishops, elders. shepherds, elders, 
no priests. Okay, the priests were what? Old Testament. Priests were temple. And so they pick up and they begin to call them what? Priests. Uh, and so that begins to be moved in. Uh, the Catholic dogma, and Catholic dogma, what that means is, is unchangeable doctrine. And so Catholic dogma taught that only priests could communicate directly with God. Only the priest. You could not communicate directly with God. Normal people can't communicate directly with God. Uh, and so therefore, all sins had to be confessed to a priest, and then the priest was the intermediary between God and men. Well, what does 1 Timothy 2.5 say? And here, if you take a note, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Right. They literally placed themselves in the position between man and God of Jesus Christ. And so they take that position. Then the rise, again, as we're going through this, and I'm going to give you some dates here in just a minute, but the rise of the papacy, or who becomes pope. <coughs> before Constantine, and that goes back when we were looking at Pergamos, before Constantine became emperor in the third century, churches did not consider any bishop to be the head of the church. So they had the bishops, they would, they would have get-togethers, they would do those kind of things, they would have their meetings, they, but, but no one was the head of but that started to come together, if you will, under the Nicolaitans. They became more and more and more drawing towards the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which again, we've talked about this a couple of times already. The Nicolaitans believed in what? Church hierarchy. Okay, here's the layman, and then would be the priests, and then there would be the bishops, and there was a hierarchy. And all the churches were controlled by the hierarchy. And so they're, they're building this up throughout this thousand-year period of time. But ultimately, the other bishops began to consider that the bishop of Rome, the guy who was, was at Rome, was, the, if you will, the superior. And eventually, the bishop of Rome was looked upon by the other bishops as papa. And of course, that turns into father. And, uh, and, then that, and, and again, even that, Matthew 23, verse 9. Matthew 23, 9. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Now, you can call your biological dad your father. That, that just happens to be an English designation of who he is. They are referring here to call no man your spiritual father. You have one spiritual father, and, and that is, that's God. And so, again, they began to introduce a number of different things into this. Uh, and, and with that introduction, whenever they do that, whenever they, they introduce new dogma, new doctrine, what does that do? It eliminates real doctrine. It sets true doctrine aside. And so as this goes along and is growing, it is saying false doctrine as, as the dogma of the church and true doctrine of the Bible as being eliminated and in completely pushed aside at, at points. The Pope ruled the Roman Catholic Church uh, as if the church were a, a Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire ultimately dissolved, uh, the Roman Catholic Church remained in, in power spiritually. And very, very interesting. Uh, as that went along in uh, 445 A.D., the Western Roman Emperor Val Valentian III, uh, as he, he decided that, again, recognizing the Pope and, and making him, and officially making him Pope, that had been done until, until this period of time, making him Pope, and so Valentian III made Leo I Pope, Leo the first, and in that happened 440 A.D. and he was it said supreme over the Catholic Church, and according to again that that comes from just some historical stuff. But all of the 630 bishops that were brought together during this time period, there's 630 bishops. They all agreed to this: what Leo believes, we all believe. 
anathema to him who believes anything else. Peter has spoken through the mouth of Leo. And, and so they set him up, and he's the first pope. Uh, they give a tremendous authority spiritually, and whenever he says, it is Peter, because they claim that Peter was the first pope. And so everything that he says comes from Peter. In 484, uh, Galatius uh, the first was made the pope, and the bishops supreme over all, and this was interesting, spiritually, they now pronounce him supreme over all human rulers in matters of faith and morals. So now he's supreme over all presidents, kings, potentates. The pope is over everybody else when it comes to, again, morals. Uh, salvation by works uh, was introduced. This is before this time, it was salvation by faith. With salvation by faith. And now it comes, oh, no, 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 the only way to get saved is through the church. And you have to do certain things to get saved. And so it's salvation by works. And uh, the sacraments, as they began to introduce the sacraments, and in how they, again, if you follow the sacraments, and you'll be saved. Because the sacraments were a way of grace. The sacraments were a way of grace. And so the sacraments were, number one, baptism, usually of infants. But if one were to come into the church as an adult, they would, they would be baptized. And at that point in time, all sins are washed away. Um, there was the Holy Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass. And it substitutes, con it substitutes continual offerings for Christ, what? One time offering. Jesus Christ, Christ died once for all. Oh. They substitute, again, this this Eucharist, this sacrificial, uh, and, and every time they take what we call communion, the wafer and the wine turns into the body and the blood, literal flesh, literal blood of Jesus Christ. It's what they taught then, it's what they teach now. Uh, also, confirmation, you go through training, and that confirmation brings you into spiritual life and, and brings you to a recipient and, and prepared, again, spiritually mature, and for the outpouring, ultimately, of the Holy Spirit. There was penance. With your penance, doing whatever you're told. You need to do this, you need to, what, Hail Marys, and all kinds of different stuff. But that was doing penance for your sin. And so you could do what the priest told you, and upon completing that work, um, your sin was forgiven. Matrimony unites a couple in marriage within the church. And, and this was one of the sacraments, was holy matrimony. A holy orders ordained certain men into the priesthood. Listen, you had to go through and become a Catholic priest, okay, to, to hold a position. Uh, if, if I believed that I was called to the priesthood, I couldn't just become a priest. You had to go through the training, you had to do all those things, and you had to agree with everything that they said. That's where Martin Luther and John Huss and a bunch of other guys ran into problems later on uh, with sola scriptura. Scripture alone is, wait a minute, this is, this is church dogma, this isn't the Bible. And, and so, again, that got them in, into some trouble. Uh, but again, holy orders, an extreme unction is administered when death seems imminent. And to grant forgiveness for the remaining sin and offer spiritual comfort to the dying. And so the priest would come and he would have extreme unction. And in most Catholic houses, uh, and that, that I've been over the years, actually, you know, I've been in many Catholic houses over the last few years. Uh, <clears throat> but there was usually, it was usually a cross. Somewhere in the house, usually hanging on a wall somewhere. And if you took it down, it opened, and, and everything needed to perform extreme unction was there. And the oil, the different things that, that were needed to, to do that were, were in this container, if you will. Uh, the mass was instituted, and within the mass, again, as I already said, it was continual sacrifice. They re-sacrificed -sacri Christ every mass. Transubstantiation is the term used. Uh, for the idea of the body and the blood of Jesus, of, 
of Jesus, the wafer and the wine becoming that body and blood. Um, then doctrines of men. They started introducing all, all kinds of, act, of doctrines that were, again, as we call dog, Catholic dogma. Celibacy and poverty of the priests and the bishops and the pope. Um, celibacy and poverty. Priests and nuns, women who took vows to serve the church, were forbidden to marry because they were considered to be married to the church. They had to live a life of celibacy, unmarried, and this practice course led to all kinds of problems uh, within the church. Uh, the vow of poverty became very popular because of the church taught that those who gave all of their money to the church and vowed to live in poverty would gain favor with God, alleviate their suffering in purgatory, uh, and this added immensely to the wealth of the church. When a, when a priest came in or something, they, they said, okay, coming in, uh, any, all, all things that they owned became the churches. All their money, all their possessions, all their land, everything went to the church. They made a vow of poverty. And everything they had went to the church. Now, all of these things are coming up, if you will, and being put together um, through this 1,000-year period of time. It wasn't all in one day. And this is just a slow building of, again, doctrine that is unscriptural, yet it's replacing the scripture right. as, as those things go on. Uh, see if I've got enough time here. I'm just going to walk through the dogmas introduced <clears throat> by the Roman Catholic Church during this time period, maybe a few years after that. But uh, prayers for the dead was introduced in 330 A.D. Uh, that, listen, someone is, okay, they've died. Um, where are they at? What did we just talk about? Purgatory. What if they couldn't quite make it into heaven? There's prayers for the dead. And so you go and you make prayers, you light candles. <clears throat> you can also buy what? Anybody remember? You buy a mass. And then they'll have a mass, and again, that mass is, and you buy the mass, by the way. And that was for the dead to get them out of purgatory a little quicker, to work, work them through purgatory. And so, again, prayers for the dead were introduced about 330 AD. The sign of the cross, of which, you know, we thought, oh, well, they've always done, you know, always done that. Sign of the cross was introduced about that same time, about 330. Worship of Mary. And the use of the title Mother of God was adopted in 431 AD. Um, listen, she was the virgin who the Holy Spirit sparked that life that became our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in her womb. She was she that found favor with God to carry the Christ child. And to bring him, again, to that place of where he's brought into the world. Uh, she's not the mother of God. Okay? And, and But again, we're going to see some other things that they did concerning Mary. Latin language was used exclusively in worship starting A.D. 600. And then also, the title Pope was made official in 610 A.D. Kissing the Pope's feet. Uh, 709, that became official. That when you approached the Pope, you know, sitting, you approached him, you would kiss his feet. You say, well, where in the world did that come from? Well, that came from the pagan custom of people coming before an emperor, bowing down and kissing his feet. And so now you're treating the Pope as though he, he's, that, he's such as an emperor. Uh, tempor temporal power of popes. Uh, and again, these are ones who, who usurped power. And um, that was done in different areas. Uh, it's, it's temporal power of popes. Um, a pope can, someone who is in and has been the pope, he can be removed and replaced by another man. His power is temporal. Now they claim he's speaking for God. They claim he's speaking for Christ. In certain times, when he sits in a certain place, Whatever he says is what? Spoken up by God, as if God said it. And, and so 
you know, these things have been introduced, but when he is no longer Pope, he no longer has the power. It's temporal power. Um, adoration of saints. Uh, that is where they began to lift the saints, if you will, uh, the apostles, to positions of worship. Adorations of cross, images, and relics. Anything that had to do with Jesus, with the crucifixion, with any of those things. And they sold them. Uh, you know, they, they would sell, like, this, this is a sliver from the cross. Uh, this is, and they, all kinds of different things. But uh, adoration of the cross, images, and relics, they would sell them to people. They would take this sliver of the cross home, and they would do what? Kneel down, bow down, and pray. They, they believed that somehow having this uh, gave them more power with God. Um, fasting. Uh, that was introduced with Lent, Advent, and on Fridays. Now, it, it, it's always humored me a little bit because there's such a big deal, and which has always been, of separation of church and state in America. How many, how many people went to public school growing up? How many had fish on Friday? We had fish every single Friday. Uh, hey, wait a minute, this is a public school. Why do I got to eat fish? Uh, but again, uh, fish, Lent, Advent, and Fridays. Fabrication, uh, or yes, the fabrication of holy water. You realize they just took water and blessed it? Okay? And it became holy water. Um, marriage of priests wasn't forbidden until 1070 AD. Until then, their, their marriage was not forbidden. Um, Rosary beads uh, were brought in in uh, 1090 A.D. when they started praying the, the rosary. Uh, sale, this, I thought, th this has been, been one thing that I've just always cringed at. Sale of indulgences, uh, A.D. 1190. And you literally could go <clears throat> and buy an indulgence. Now, they stopped doing this, by the way. But you could go and you could buy indulgences. You say, hey, you know what? Uh, Saturday night's coming up, and I'm going to go have me a really good time. Uh, I, I, I want five indulgences. That forgave you for? Five sins. Five sins. So, I mean, you, you, were, you were buying forgiveness before you committed the sin. Um, <clears throat> buying indulgences. Uh, sacrifice of the mass officially recognized. And so the Jesus Christ, body and blood, the sacrifice of the mass was officially recognized. In uh, AD 1215, uh, the transubstantiation of the bread and, and, the, and the wine was also 1215. Um, confessing your sins only to a priest, 1215. Uh, the adoration of the water, turning it into holy water, about the same time. Um, People are forbidden to take up the cup of the communion wine. Take it, they could earlier, they would pass it around, everybody would take the cup and take a drink from it. Uh, and they came and said, wait a minute, we're not going to do that. Which is, that, that's probably a good idea. Uh, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. And so that was, again, set aside, that was forbidden. Uh, purgatory proclaimed. I already touched on purgatory, it's that intermittent spot. And so purgatory, that was 1438 A.D., and the apocryphal books, that is, if you have a Catholic Bible, you open it up, there's the Old Testament that we know of, there's the New Testament that, that we know. In between them is the apocryphal books. Uh, they were added to the Bible 1546 A.D. And so over 1500 years, basically after the canon of the Scripture had been decided, the Catholics said, oh no, we're going to accept also the apocryphal books. And the reason for that was they couldn't defend some of the doctrines that they were taking. They were being challenged as to those doctrines, and these books that had been rejected as Scripture covered some of those doctrines. So they brought those books and said, okay, we also believe these books. Uh, and it again gave them a scripture that they could go to and say, this is why we do this. 
Uh, Immaculate Conception of Mary Made Official. 18, this is 1845. I'm jumping a little past that thousand years right now, but a couple of things are important. The Immaculate Conception of Mary is made official. That means that Mary was born, as was Jesus, without sin. And so they made that official in 1845. And the infallibility of the Pope absolutely is infallible as Christ in 1870. So these are a number of the things that have were brought in, not just that thousand years, I know that last three or so that I did was, was after that. But these things were brought in as part of and becoming the Roman Catholic Church as we know it. And that all started during this thousand year period of history of which Thyatira is the example. And so I just as we walk through that, um, and we will pick up with Sardis next week and continue walking through the seven churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your love for us. Uh, when, as we look, as we, as we pray, as we study, um, God, you, you know, it is my habit to simply preach through the word. Uh, but when we come to this area, when we come to the seven churches, when we look at this history, we see how the churches all came together. Uh, we see, Heavenly Father, the perversions that were introduced. But we also will see, as we move through these seven churches, the great revival that is going to take place. And so, Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Thank you for all you've done for the church and the churches. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this morning, as we have listened to this history, that it just makes us stronger in our knowledge, in our own personal history, that we're biblicists. It doesn't matter what Catholicism said or, or, or any of the other isms. It doesn't matter the stands that they take. But Heavenly Father, what matters is what do you say? It doesn't matter what Calvinism has to say. It doesn't matter what Arminianism has to say or Mormonism. What matters, God, is what do you have to say in your word? God, thank you for drawing us to simply being biblicists, believing and following your word. God, we thank you for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.